Hello, it's Keith here and this is lesson 3 of the Hello World series of my ARM assembly programming tutorials. Today we're going to be learning how to make this, this Hello World example for the Nintendo DS. So we're going to learn how to make a basic cartridge, we'll also learn how to compile it with our assembler and get it running on the emulator, the latter part being very straightforward. Okay, well let's go over to the source code and let's take a look at what we're dealing with. Right, so the Nintendo DS is basically the same as the Game Boy Advance in a lot of ways, at least as far as today's tutorial is considered. So um, we're working with a bitmap screen, we've got no firmware to help us out, and we're going to be using our own font. We're actually using the font from Tubi Ackermans today. It's a 1-bit per pixel font. We're going to be converting it to the 15-bit per pixel that the screen needs. Now this all means that we need to work out our cursor position for the next character that we're going to draw. So we're doing that here. We're defining some of the console memory as um, RAM area here. We're using this 2F and then five zeros here as the start of our RAM that the cartridge will use for the sort of variables. And we're defining the cursor X and Y position, which is going to start at zero. And it's just the net position for the next characters we're drawing across the screen. We've then got this quite massive header here. Now the game is going to end up executing from the memory address two million and we need to have this 32k header here and you can see it here now there are some bits that are relatively important now of course it can just run as is but um if you were changing things you do need to understand a few things now the first thing is that the nintendo ds actually has two processors there's the main processor which is the arm 9 and then there's the sub processor which is the arm 7 and i believe the sub processor is used by the game boy advance games you know, for backward compatibility but it's also um it's also used by some of the sound chips and some of the input devices like the pen they can only be accessed by the ARM7 and I've covered them in another tutorial. Now we don't need the ARM7 today but we do need to give it something to do. The other thing is the ARM9 we need to define our program of course this thing you're seeing here but it needs to be transferred to somewhere within RAM. It's copied from the uh, cartridge into RAM. It's actually decrypted as well but um, it runs from RAM and so we're defining the memory address of the cartridge and the destination that it's going to end up in RAM here and that's, uh, that's what we're doing here. So what we're doing is we're transferring that to this memory address here. We're transferring a dummy ARM7 program to this address here. And the rest I think is pretty much um, standard. We don't need to change it. Now our ARM7 program is just an infinite loop here. It's very boring. We just need to give that ARM7 something to do so it doesn't crash. And then the ARM9 is the actual program here. And this is the actual um, test example we're seeing today. So the first thing is we're defining a stack pointer. We're defining at the top of the memory area here. You can see we're using 2F and then these zeros here. Uh, this is at 3 million, so it's at the end of that range. And our program cartridge is being loaded to the start of that range, so we're hopefully not overlapping anything there. Okay, so we've set up our stack pointer here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to set up basically the same kind of screen as we used on the Game Boy Advance before, but the procedure is a little bit different. The first thing we need to do is we need to turn on the power control for the graphics hardware. So we do that with... 400304, the memory address there, and we write 8003 to that address. That turns on the graphics hardware. Now, the Nintendo DS actually has two graphics processors. There's the Engine A, which is the better one, and the Engine B, which is the sub one. Now, the Engine B is pretty much just a regular Game Boy Advance. It's got the same sort of level. The, the, the first one, the Engine A, has some extra capabilities. Now, that's why often in Nintendo DS games, the, the top screen will be used for 3D, and the bottom one just has some very simple graphics on it. It's because there's a limitation of the second screen. Some games do cheat. They will alternate between the two displays and they will take a screen capture of the previous 3D frame and they will use the engine B to show it. That's why some games do actually look like they're showing 3D on both screens. It's a trick, it's halving the frame rate. Perfectly acceptable trick, but it, it they aren't actually, engine B can't actually do that 3D as well is all I'm really trying to say. Okay, so we're using engine A here. We're using a VRAM display. The option is slightly different to the option that we used on the Game Boy Advance example because it is an extra function we've got here. So we're using a memory address 4 million here and we're writing hexadecimal 20,000 to that. That is turning on the VRAM display here. The final thing we need to do is we need to enable the VRAM memory. We need to turn on the bank of memory and allocate it. And we're doing that with 400240 memory address. And we're just writing hexadecimal 80 to that. That turns on the VRAM. If we didn't do that, we wouldn't be able to write anything to the screen. So that's what we're doing. 
Now, the rest of the code is very similar to what we often see. In my tutorials, I always use character 255 terminated strings, and I write a print char routine, and then I write a print string routine that uses that print char routine, and that's what we've got here. So here's our hello world message. Now, um, on the ARM, often we can't load addresses directly, and so here we've got it loaded as what this ARM assembler I'm using VASM in STD mode, and it, it calls a long 32 bits and a word 16 bits, which I know is not technically correct for this process, which it's the 68,000 syntax, I guess. But um, basically, this is the 32 bit address of the string, and we're loading that into R1, and then we're running this print string routine, which repeatedly loads in bytes into R0 until we get a character 255, at which point it will return. So, all the work is being done by this print char routine. Now, we're using this bitmap font here. Uh, the bitmap font starts from character 32, which is space, and it uses one byte per line, eight pixels and one bit per pixel. So you can see here, this is a space because all these bytes are zero. And then we're going through the character set. I think maybe this is an exclamation mark possibly, and this is a pair of quotes, I think. So it, as I say, it's one bit per pixel. We're gonna convert this, and uh, that's actually the end of the cartridge. So that's the last thing in this. So we're going to be converting it, and the conversion routine is basically the same as the Game Boy Advance version. The um, VRAM base, I think, is different this time because the, the way we're using the VRAM is slightly different. And so what we're doing here is we are taking cursor X here, and we are effectively going to multiply that by 16. Now, why 16? Well, because we are 8 pixels per character horizontally, and there are 2 bytes per pixel because it's 15 bits per pixel with one unused bit or an alpha bit in some cases. So we're multiplying the X position by 16. We're multiplying the Y position by the width of the screen, 256 pixels, the number of bytes per pixel, two bytes, and the number of lines per character, because we're moving down one character if y, if cursor y equals one. So 256 times eight times two, we're using the multiply command to calculate that here. And then we're adding the x and the y offset to the VRAM base, and that is now our starting position for our character. Okay, now what we need to do is calculate the offset within that font. So we're loading in the address of the bitmap font. We're then taking 32 from the character we want to show, and that's because the first character is character 32, so we're now working from character zero, so to speak. And there are eight bytes per character because it's one bit per pixel, eight lines, so eight bytes. So we are shifting the remaining offset to the left by three bits, effectively multiplying it by eight. It's actually faster to do a shift than to do the multiply command. So that's why we're using shift here, and it's only this one we're using the multiply for. We could probably actually do that with shifts as well in this case, I think. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to read in a byte from that font and we're going to look at each bit and if the bit is one, we're going to draw a pixel to the screen and if the bit is zero, we're not going to draw anything in this case. We could, could draw black, I suppose, but in this case, we're not gonna draw anything. So here's the mask for testing each bit and here is the color we're going to draw to the screen, which in this case is yellow. And so what we're doing here is we're testing the bit of the read in byte. We read in the byte into R8 here, and then we're testing it, comparing it to our mask. And if the bit is not zero, then we are writing our color to VRAM here, which is what we calculated up here. We're then moving across VRAM by one pixel. We're then moving our bit mask by one bit, so effectively moving this one to the next position for the next test. And we're repeating until we've done all the horizontal pixels, all eight of them. We're then moving down one screen line, which is effectively 256 pixels across times two, so 512 minus one character, because we've already moved across by one character. So eight times two, eight pixels times two, which is 16. So that's effectively moving us down one line of the screen. And then we are just repeating for all eight of the horizontal lines of our character. We've now drawn the character to the screen. So we're just increasing our X position and returning. So that's how we're printing the character to the screen. And we're just repeating that until we print our hello world to the screen, as you can see just here. Okay, so that's how we're creating our hello world. How do we actually compile it? Well, of course you can use other assemblers, but I try and always use VASM. So I'm using VASM in ARM mode here, and this is using the standard syntax. That's the one I'm using. 
Now we've got this batch file here, which will compile this for you. Now I should point out at this point, you can get all of the source code and also the, all the build scripts for today's example from my website. So you should be able to do all of this just by hitting F6 and compiling as I did. But if you are creating your own or you've got a better assembler, that's fantastic. But I'm, I'm just gonna describe the settings I'm using for today's example. Now in this batch file, where you see percent build file percent, this is actually the source file. So this would be your NDS hello.asm or whatever your file is called. Um, then what we've got here is a setting here, which is we're actually using ARM7 assembly here. We don't need the ARM9 functionality. I only tend to use ARM4 functionality anyway. So um, I'm using an M7 version here, which is the minimum because of the second processor is an ARM7. We've got a no eye align option here. Now you wouldn't actually need that. That's just for thumb. With for thumb, we don't want to be 32-bit aligned at all times. So that's why I've got that there. Um, we're then disabling case sensitivity and we're also telling it to check labels. And this means that if we forget to tab indent one of our commands, the assembler will check and say, hang on a minute, that label looks like a command. I think you forgot the tab there, which is helpful for me at least. We're then defining some symbols. Now, build NDS is used by my multi-platform code, some of my code compiles on the Game Boy Advance and the Nintendo ADS. We've got some um, compiler, conditional compilation to do that, and that's used there, but you won't need it for that simple example. And the VASM equals one is just in case I, if I decide to change my assembler later, maybe I can get the um, code to compile on both. So just for future proofing there. The more important one is this slash L build listing dot txt now this is creating a listing file now what this is is this contains the source commands and also the destination bytes this is quite handy if you're having trouble with your code now here's a listing file here and what you can see is it actually contains the source command and then it shows the bytes that are produced now you can see, for example, that this move command here has compiled to these four bytes here, which probably isn't that surprising, but you might find in some cases things don't quite happen as you'd expect. This move command here has converted to eight bytes here. And the reason for that is that the um, parameter here is too big to load in in a single command. So it's been converted to two and this could cause some quite unexpected results. So in some cases, these listing files can really help you out if you're having trouble. Occasionally you might find there's a bug in your assembler as well. So if you're an advanced user or if you're feeling confident, these listing files are great. But if you're just starting out and you're using a different assembler and you can't figure out how to get the listing file, you probably don't need to worry about it because it's probably going to be, you won't understand what you're seeing anyway, but it's a nice thing to have if you can have it. Now, we're specifying here that we're outputting a binary file, and we're specifying the name of that binary file here, program.nds, and this is actually compiling, because we've got that header, it's compiling a complete cartridge, at least as far as our emulators are concerned. I don't think it'd run on a real Nintendo DS. It will run on mine. Um, I, it depends on the um, cartridge you've got. I, you've, you need to have one of those um, SD card cartridge converters, but um, it, as I say, it, it's complete enough for some cases. Now, we're using DS. MU ME here and we are specifying the cartridge on the command line that's the fastest way of getting it started of course you could also load it from the file menu if you preferred you of course you can just load in from the file menu here if that's the way you'd rather do things but generally speaking we want to try and do things in the fastest possible way so we can spend more time fixing our code and less time starting our cartridges Okay, so that's the Hello World example. The final thing I always include in these Hello World examples is a bit of a bonus, this version with a monitor debugger here. So here's our Hello World. And now we've got a dump of all of the registers and also a dump of some of the memory. And this is just a little bonus that I include because basically my Hello World example is, um, is enough pretty much to get this um, extra monitor and debugger working. Now, the only thing I have added here is a new line command. You can see here, we're just zeroing the X position and increasing the Y position. And we are including the hello world here, the, this monitor here. And th this is just specifying the width of the monitor for the screen. Now, the smaller Game Boy Advance screen, we can only fit eight, six characters on the screen for the dump of memory, but the Nintendo DS has a much nice wider screen. Now, I'm not going to describe how these work because they're pretty complicated and sometimes they do change to cope with bugs and things. But basically, we've got this monitor function we can run here that will show the contents of the registers but won't change any. It's important. And also, we've got a mem dump. We just specify an address we want to dump and a number of lines. And that will be dumped to the screen. And you can see that just here. So that's the mem dump. 
and that's the monitor. And these are intended for if you're testing things, either if your program's not working and you need to know why, or if you're playing with reading the joystick or the mouse or the pen or something, you can just you know read in straight from the registers and dump the contents to the screen so that you can quickly see what's going on. So these will hopefully help you out. As I say, it's just a little free bonus for this example because it's basically all covered anyway. And if you're getting started with Hello World, then your next stage is likely to be, okay, well, I want to test the memory. I want to test these devices and I want to get, get things going quickly so maybe they'll be useful to you. Anyway, that's all we are going to be covering today. As I said before, you can go to the website, you can download today's example source code, you can also download the build scripts and the emulators all pre-configured with the um, Notepad++ that I use. So hopefully that'll get you started nice and quickly. That's the intent. If you've liked what you've seen, please hit the like button and subscribe because if you like the videos, YouTube recommends them to more people and they may like them as well. And if you subscribe, it encourages me to keep making content because um, every, every tutorial I make is an easy thing gone and it means I have to find something harder to cover next time because there's a rapidly decreasing number of things I know to cover. So it would help me out if you subscribed. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this and I hope you have some fun programming the Nintendo DS. Thanks for watching today. If you've enjoyed this video today, please consider supporting my content. It takes 20 to 30 hours a week to keep making these videos. It's basically all I do when I'm not doing my day job and it's only through the support of my patrons and the other sponsors that I'm able to continue Justify doing it essentially. You can back me on Patreon. I post a weekly update with the latest work on the current projects I'm doing. You can see one here and also the newest videos. There's a large backlog of videos that are currently only available to the patrons, although they will all be available to everyone later on. And also it's the backers who I ask when it comes to making decisions on how to change the content in the future, what new content to create and things like that. You can see there was recently a survey of the backers so I can plan next year's content. As well as Patreon, you can now become a member of my channel on YouTube. There's a join button you should see just below this video. You can use that. YouTube backers get the same content as Patreon. I just post it through the YouTube interface instead of the Patreon one. It's the same content every week. Also, if you prefer, you can go to my Teespring store and you can get some Chibi Akamas merchandise or some Learn ASM merchandise if you prefer, if that's how you'd like to back me. Links for all three are in the description of this video below. Uh, anyway, whatever you decide to do, I hope you've really enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.